Book of Heaven, Volume 28, Part 8 September 30th, 1930 Eden, Field of Light Difference between one who operates in the divine will and one who operates in the human will. The little ground of the creature. The celestial sower. I was continuing my usual acts in the divine volition, and my poor mind paused in Eden, where God created man to give rise to the life of the creature. And my beloved good Jesus, making himself seen, all tenderness and goodness told me, My daughter, Eden, is field of light, in which our supreme being created man. It can be said that he was created in the light of our fiat. His first act of life was light, such that, as an interminable field of light would extend behind and before him, to the right and to the left, he was to follow his way in order to form his life, drawing into his acts as much light for as many acts as he would do, so as to form a light all his own, as his property by virtue of his acts, though drawn from my divine will. Now here is the difference of one who operates in it as his origin and end, in which all of his acts are bound to the origin of the light where his life was formed and had its first act of life. The light keeps this life in custody, defends it, and lets nothing extraneous enter into its light so as to form one of the portents which only the light knows how to form. On the other hand, one who goes down from this light enters into the dark prison of his will, and in doing his act, he draws darkness, and he draws as much darkness for as many acts as he forms, to form for himself a property all of darkness, all his own. Darkness does not know how to keep or defend one who lives in it, and if one does any good act in it, it is always tenebrous, because they are bound by darkness. And since darkness does not have the virtue of being able to defend, things enter which are extraneous to darkness itself. The bothers of weaknesses enter, the enemies of passions, the fierce thieves that hurl the creature into sin and reach the point of hurling her into eternal darkness where there is no hope of light. What difference between one who lives in the light of my divine will and one who lives as though imprisoned in his human will? Afterwards, I continued to follow the order of the divine will, which it had in creation, and my little and poor intelligence paused at the point when God created the Immaculate Virgin. And my lovable Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, My daughter, all the good and holy acts of the prophets, the patriarchs, and of the ancient people, formed the ground in which the Supreme Being sowed the seed, in order to make germinate the life of the celestial baby Mary because her seed 
was taken from the human stock. The Virgin, having within herself the operating life of the divine will, expanded this ground with her acts, fecundated it, and divinized it. She made flow in it more than beneficial and refreshing rain, the sanctity of her virtues, the heat of her love, and darting through it with the light of the sun of the divine will, which she possessed as her own. She prepared the ground to germinate the celestial Savior, and our divinity opened heaven and made the just one, the holy one, the word, rain down into this shoot. And so my life was formed, human and divine, to form the redemption of mankind. See then, in all our works, directed for the good of creatures, we want to find a shelf, a place, a little ground in which to lay our work and the good we want to give to creatures. Otherwise, where do we put it? In the air? Without one at least who would know it and would draw us with her acts, forming her little ground. And we ask the celestial sower, sowing the good we want to give? If it were not so, that on both sides, creator and creature, they feel drawn together, she preparing herself to receive with her little acts, God by giving. It would be as if we did or wanted to give nothing to the creature. So the acts of the creature prepare the ground for the divine sower. If there is no soil, there is no sowing to hope for. No one goes to sow if he does not have a little ground. Much less does God, celestial sower, cast the seed of his truths, the fruit of his works. If he does not find the little ground of the creature, the divinity, in order to operate, first wants to place itself in agreement with the soul. After we have agreed together, and we see that she wants to receive that good, to the point of praying us and forming for us the ground in which to lay it, then, with all love, we give it. Otherwise, it would be like exposing our works to uselessness. October 7th, 1930 How Redemption is Owed to the Faithfulness of the Most Holy Virgin Faithfulness Sweet Chain That Captures God the celestial farmer. Necessity of the seed in order to be able to diffuse the divine works. I was following the divine will, and my poor mind was occupied over the many things spoken to me by my sweet Jesus on the kingdom of his divine fiat. And it seemed to me, in my ignorance, Oh, how difficult is its realization upon earth, its reigning and its triumph in the midst of creatures. But while I was thinking this, my sweet Jesus told me, My daughter, redemption is owed to the faithfulness of the Virgin Queen. 
Oh, had I not found this excelling creature, who denied me nothing, nor did she ever draw back before any sacrifice, her firmness in asking for redemption without ever hesitating, her faithfulness without ever tiring, her ardent and strong love without ever stopping, always at her place all of her creator without ever moving whatever thing or incident she might see on the part of god and on the part of creatures she formed such bonds between heaven and earth she acquired such ascendancy such dominion before her creator as to render herself worthy of making the divine word descend upon earth. In the face of a faithfulness never interrupted, and of our very divine will, which held its kingdom in her virgin heart, our strength was not enough for us to refuse. Her faithfulness was the sweet chain that bound me and captured me from heaven to earth. Here is why, then, what creatures did not obtain in many centuries, they obtained by means of the sovereign queen. Ah, yes, she alone was the worthy one who merited that the divine word would descend from heaven to earth, and that she received the great good of redemption in such a way that, if they want to, all can receive the good of being redeemed. Firmness, faithfulness, unshakability in good, and in asking for the good known, can be called divine virtues, not human. And therefore it would be like denying to ourselves what the creature asks from us. Now, the same in the kingdom of the divine will. We want to find a faithful soul in whom we can operate who would bind us everywhere and in every part of our divine being with the sweet chain of her faithfulness in such a way that we may find no reason not to give her what she asks from us. We want to find our firmness, the necessary shelf to be able to enclose in her the great good that she asks from us. It would not be decorous for our divine works to be entrusted to souls who are inconstant and not disposed to face any sacrifice for us. The sacrifice of the creature is the defense of our works, and it is like putting them in a safe place. So, once we have found the faithful creature, and the work comes out of us to take its place in her. Everything is done. The seed is already sown. And little by little, it germinates and produces other seeds, such that as they diffuse, whoever wants to can procure for himself that seed to make it germinate in his soul. Does the farmer not do the same? If he has the good of having one single seed, which can be his fortune, he sows it into his field. That seed, by germinating, can produce ten, twenty, thirty seeds and the farmer no longer sows only one of them, 
but all those which he has reaped. And he returns to sow them over again until he is able to fill all his field. And he reaches the point of being able to give to others the seed of his fortune. Much more can I do, celestial farmer. As long as I find a creature with the field of her soul prepared, in which I can sow the seed of my works. That seed will germinate, and little by little it will make its way. It will make itself known, loved, and desired by few, and then by many that the celestial seed of my divine will be sown into their souls. Therefore, my daughter, be attentive and faithful. Allow that I may sow this celestial seed in your soul, and I may find no hindrance to let it germinate. If there is the seed, there is the sure hope that in germinating it can produce more seeds. But if the seed does not exist, all the hopes cease, and it is useless to hope for the kingdom of my divine will, just as it would have been useless to hope for redemption if the celestial queen had not conceived me as the fruit of her maternal womb, the fruit of her faithfulness, of her firmness and sacrifice. Therefore let me do, and be faithful to me, and I will take care of everything else. Fiat October 12th, 1930. Fear is the scourge of the poor nothing. The love that God nurtures for the creature, to the point of putting her in a contest with himself. How God established all the acts that all creatures were to do. I am always in my dear and holy inheritance of the divine fiat. I feel the extreme need never to go out of it, because my small atom of my existence feels its nothingness, and as nothing, good at doing nothing if the divine volition playing with it does not fill it with its all making it do what it wants. And oh, how I feel the need for the divine will to keep me in its life, and for me to remain always in it. Now, I felt I could not live without the divine fiat. All fear. And my sweet Jesus, with an unspeakable goodness, told me, my daughter, do not fear. Fear is the scourge of the poor nothing, in such a way that the nothing, which is beaten by the whips of fear, feels itself lacking life and losing it. On the other hand, love is the surge of the nothing into the all, such that, as the all fills it with divine life, the nothing feels true life, which is not subject to be lacking, but to always living. Now you must know that the love that our divine being nurtures toward the creature is so great that we give her of our own in order to put her in the conditions of being able to compete with her creator. And so we give her our will, our love, 
and our very life, that she may make it fully her own, so as to fill the void of her nothing, and therefore be able to give us will for will, love for love, life for life. And we, even though we ourselves have given them, accept them as if they were her own, enjoying that the creature can compete with us. She, in giving us, and we, in receiving, to give to her again what she gave us, that she may always have something to give us except for the creature who would not want to receive. Then she feels the void of her nothing, without true life, without a divine will that sanctifies her, without the love that leads her to love her creator. And then all evils swoop down upon this nothing, Lashes of fear, darkness of terror, rains of all miseries, weaknesses, such that she feels life missing in her. Poor nothing which is not filled with the all. Then I continue to pray all abandoned in the sweet empire of the divine will. And my beloved Jesus added, My daughter, our most high will, in creating man, already established all the acts that all creatures were to do, and constituted itself life of all these acts. So, there is not one human act which does not have its place in our divine will. And when the creature performs each of her acts, our will enters the field of action in the human act of the creature. Therefore, all the power and sanctity of a divine will enter into the act of each of them. Each act entered the order of all creation, each one taking its place, almost like stars, as each of them has its place under the azure of the heavens. And since everything, the whole of mankind with all their acts, was ordered, and formed by our divine fiat in creation. When the creature does an act, the entire order of creation is moved, and our will is an act as if it were then creating the whole creation. In fact, in our will, Everything is an act. And the act of the creature enters into its act. And as it takes its place established by God, the effects of all creation are renewed. And the human act enters the race of all created things and holds its distinct place in it, and is always in motion within the divine motion to adore and love its creator. Therefore, the operating of the creature in our divine will can be called the fecund and divine field of our very will within the little field of the creature. Fiat October 18, 1930 
value of the kisses and embraces of the Virgin to baby Jesus, because, possessing the divine will, all of her acts rendered themselves infinite and immense for Jesus. Resurrection of the Acts Done in the Divine Will Effects of the I Love You I continue in my usual state, and pausing in the act when the Sovereign Queen gave birth to little baby Jesus, and clasping him to her breast, kissed him and kissed him again, and delighting in him, gave him her most sweet milk. Oh, how I, too, yearned to give him my affectionate kisses and my tender embraces to my little child Jesus. And he, making himself seen in act of receiving them, told me, Daughter of my volition, all the value of the acts of my celestial mamma was because they came out of the immense womb of my divine will, whose kingdom whose life she possessed. There was not one motion, act, breath, and heartbeat, which was not full of supreme volition, up to overflowing outside. Her loving kisses that she gave me came out of the font of it, her chaste embraces, with which she embraced my infantile humanity, contained the immensity. In her most pure milk, with which she nourished me, as I suckled from her virginal breast, I suckled from the immense breast of my fiat, and in that milk I suckled its infinite joys, its ineffable sweetnesses, the food, the substance, the infantile growth of my humanity from the immense abyss of my divine will. So in her kisses I felt the eternal kiss of my will, which, when it does an act, never ceases doing it. In her embraces, I felt a divine immensity embracing me. And in her milk, I nourished myself divinely and humanly. And she gave me back my celestial joys and the contentments of my divine will, which kept her all filled. If the Sovereign Queen had not had a divine will in her power, I would not have contented myself with her kisses, with her love, with her embraces, and with her milk. At the most, my humanity would have been content. But my divinity, I, Word of the Father, who had the infinite, the immense, in my power, wanted infinite kisses, immense embraces, milk full of divine joys and sweetnesses. And only in this way was I satisfied, as my mamma, possessing my divine will, could give me kisses, embraces, love and all her acts that gave of the infinite. Now you must know that all the acts that are done in my divine will are inseparable from it. It can be said that they form one single thing, act and will. The will can be called light, the act, heat, which are inseparable from each other. So all those who will possess my fiat as life will have in their power all the acts of the celestial mamma. 
that she had in her power all of their acts, in such a way that, in her kisses and embraces, I felt myself kissed and embraced by all those who were to live in my will, and in them I feel myself being kissed again and embraced by my mamma. Everything is in common and in perfect accord in my will. Each human act descends from its womb, and with its power, it makes it rise back into the center from which it came out. Therefore be attentive, and let nothing escape you which does not enter into my divine will. If you want to give me everything, and receive everything. My poor mind continues its course inside the divine will, according to the circumstances I find myself in. But my point of support, my origin, the means, the end of my acts, is always the divine will. Its life runs within me, like the sweet murmuring of the sea, which never stops. And I, as requital of homage and of love, give to it the murmuring of my acts, which the same divine fiat makes me do. And my always lovable Jesus continues, telling me, My daughter, each act done in my divine will, forms a divine resurrection in the soul. Life is formed, not of one act, but of many acts united together. So, the more acts are done, so many times does she rise again in my will, in such a way as to be able to form a complete life, all of divine will. Just as the human life is formed of many distinct members in order to be able to form its life, and if there were only one member, it could not be called life. And if some members were missing, it would be called defective life. In the same way, the repeated acts done in my will serve as it different members of divine will were formed in the creature. And while they serve to reunite together these acts in order to form the life, they serve to nourish the same life. And since my divine will has no end, the more acts are done in it, the more its divine life grows in the creature. And while this life rises again and grows, the human will receives death from these very acts done in my divine volition. It finds no nourishments with which to nourish itself, and feels itself dying at each act done in my divine will. But what sorrow! As many times as the creature does her will in her acts, so many times does she make mine die in her act. Oh, how horrifying it is to see that a finite will casts out of its act an infinite will that wants to give it life of light, of beauty, of sanctity. Then I continued my acts in the divine volition. With my usual refrain, I love you. I love you in everything you have done for love of us. But while I was doing this, I thought to myself, Blessed Jesus must be tired of my sing-song. I love you. I love you. So why say it? 
and my sweet Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, My daughter, true love, accompanied also by the words, I love you, never brings me tiredness. Because I, being a complex of love, and a continued act of love, as I never cease to love, when I find my love in the creature, I find myself. And the sign that her love is a birth from my love is when it is continuous. An interrupted love is not the sign of divine love. At the most, it can be a love of circumstances, an interested love, such that, as these cease, love ceases. And also the words, I love you, I love you, are nothing other than the air that my love produces in the creature, which, condensed within her, produces as though many flashes of little flames toward the one whom she loves. And I, when I hear you say, I love you, I love you, do you know what I say? My daughter is flashing in the air of her love toward me, and one flash does not wait for another. And besides, all continuous acts are those which have the virtue of preserving, nourishing, and growing the life of creatures. See, also the sun rises every morning and has its continued act of light. Nor can it be said that by rising every day it tires men and the earth. Rather, the complete opposite. All long for the rising of the sun, and only because it rises every day does it form the nourishment of the earth. Day after day, it keeps nourishing, little by little, the sweetness in the fruits until it makes them reach perfect maturation. It nourishes the very tints of colors for the flowers, the development for all the plants, and so with all the rest. A continued act can be called perennial miracle, though creatures do not pay attention to it. But your Jesus cannot do without paying attention, because I know the prodigious virtue of an act never interrupted. Therefore your I love you serves to preserve, nourish, and grow the life of my love in you. If you do not nourish it, it cannot grow nor receive the multiplicity of the sweetnesses and the variety of the divine colors which my love contains. Fiat You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 28, Part 8. Fiat